Thanks. Um, okay, so getting started. About Mondata, we're obviously a sponsor of the event. So has everyone read the blurb? Can I get a show of hands, please, <laughs> about what we do? Everyone wrote the blurb. <laughs> There's a team up there that did that, and that's cool. Um, excellent. So a uh, very brief executive summary is we make software packages, um, so traditional PKGs for installation on Mac platforms, and they work in anything. Um, that's the bottom line. If you really want to talk about that, talk about talk about that with me afterwards. Um, about me, um, so I'm, I've been a sysadmin, I've been a software developer, I, as Tony mentioned, talk at the occasional conference. Um, just generally, I'm a, a very, very fast talking nerd who deep dives into everything I do. And just to get this out of the way, because I know a lot of people tend to look at the t-shirt and try and read what it says, so. <laughs> There we go, that's done. All right, about this session. So it's inter interesting. This is gonna seem like it should be at a developer conference more than anything else, but really it's, it's about applying these principles to being a sysadmin, for want of a better term. So using the same principles you would in software development lifecycle and using it in sysadmin mode, because they will ultimately help you um, so, you know, things you might want to do, you could want to solve a problem, so you've got something that's really, well, basically giving you the shits and you want to make that problem go away. Um, you might want to automate part of your role. I know we all want to do that. I've spent my entire life trying to make myself redundant, um, and I always seem to come up with new ways to do that, so I don't know how that works. Maybe I can automate the redundancy creation. <laughs> Um, or you want to improve your user experience in the Apple sphere, that's a, a very big deal. That's something you're always trying to do. So, um, oh, you'll have to be, I guess this is, these are the, the things and stuff that are transferable from a development world into a sysadmin world. Uh, I remember seeing a, a gentleman here who's in the audience many, many years ago do a session about don't be a sysadmin. Um, which was about this style of thing. And um, that kind of stuck with me, and I've, I've leveraged a lot of that ever since. But thank you, Ed. Um, first one, version control. This is so stupidly important, it's ridiculous. Even if you are writing a script to do something, having something to do version control in the back end so that you can see your changes, you can document the changes you made, all of those bits and pieces, it's incredibly useful. There are tons of free tools out there. Here's one. Um, it's the one I use by choice. Um, you know, it's got a stigma attached to it at the moment, like the world blew up a, a couple of weeks ago when Microsoft announced or the, the announcement was made that Microsoft were acquiring it. I don't care, it probably won't change, and even if it does, it won't change that much. Seriously, the user community is that big that there'd be a huge backlash. Um, go there, get hold of it, start playing. If you don't want to go into the Microsoft sphere, go to GitLab. Um, I remember Joel Rennick getting uh, a, a lot of uh, stick from one Greg Nagel <laughs> at a particular conference because he used GitLab and Greg used GitHub like everybody else was, um, which was a mildly entertaining thing. But once again, go there, sign in, away you go. Um, you know, basically free to get started. And I know a lot of the universities, um, so GitLab, you know, trying to break market share, actually jumping into the university space and giving it away to them for free, <laughs> um, like Red Hat do, anyone. Um, so tools. Anyway, version control, that's, your, that's kind of your first tool, but it's a, it's a big thing, because you want to keep tab tab on, tabs on what's going on. This is kind of an endless list, so I didn't even bother putting anything up. <laughs> um, you know, you have editors, you have UI design tools, you have um, graphics tools for like creating UI elements. You, it's, it's just ridiculous. Pick something that works for you. Pick something that is built for purpose. Pick something that you are familiar with and comfortable with. Like, I mean, my editor of choice is not an IDE. Um, I kind of get really sarky when code auto fills out for me. Um, 
I prefer to actually choose my own destiny. So I live in BB Edit. Um, formerly it was Text Wrangler and I stay there. The syntax highlighting is really good and the keyboard shortcuts uh, for navigation through the text are actually the same as that in the terminal. And given that's kind of where I spend most of my life, it works for me, but it works for me. You need to pick what works for you. Big deal. Um, this one's an interesting one. You don't even think about this most of the time as a sysadmin because you are the support model for it. But what you need to know is who is going to support this thing that you are making. Does anyone think about this when they're doing stuff or do they just immediately assume that it's them? Can I get a show of hands on this one? Who assumes that they are going to be the person who supports what they create? Mm -hmm. Who knows that other people are going to have to support what they're doing? Yeah. So, is it you? Is it others? Is it your successes? Now, this is one that a lot of people fail to think about. You might get fired, but you might move on. You might find a better job. You don't want to walk out of an organization and find that when you talk to those people six months later, they all hate you because you left them with a flaming pile of dog crap that they did not understand because you had not handed off a support model to them. Careful. The other one is vendors. Um, so if you're writing an integration with vendor software or you're working between two places and say you're working as a consultant, which I did a lot of last year, um, and you write a piece of middleware to go between two pieces of software. You need to make sure that your vendor support is across what you have done as well as the organization that you're doing stuff for and so on and so forth. Because otherwise people are just going to be completely and utterly unaware of what's going on. Um, do we have a timer here anywhere? Sorry? Oh, that'd be good. Because um, I have no idea how I'm tracking. Um, writing things, language selection. Once again, there's a few parameters here that help guide you. What's best for purpose? What is a language that works well with what you're attempting to do? Because um, a lot of people say, you know, you should do everything in Python or you should do everything in there or don't do stuff in Bash or whatever. What is fit for purpose? Um, you know, I find that uh, a lot of the time I, I sort of jump around from language to languages. And I know a lot of them. I think I know about 12 at the moment, possibly, maybe more by now. I don't know, 12 was last count. Um, and you have to think about what the other people who may be supporting it or looking at it, your successes, all of that sort of stuff, what are they going to know? So write, oh, okay, that's good. Um, write in the sense that is, I guess, going to tie in with all of the things that you're doing. Um, so there's a great example out there. Uh, anyone familiar with Reposado? So the open source software update server um, and Margarita, the web-based front end on it? Okay, so Margarita was very intently written in Python um, because they didn't want to replicate a whole bunch of functionality and they straight up import all of the Reposado common library into the Python script that is Margarita so that they don't have to reinvent code and they use embedded functions from Reposado during the generation of the web interface, which I think is a clever little way of doing things. It makes it a lot easier. So, you know, that's, that's the sort of thing I'm talking about. So we're tying into something that is written in a particular language. So I'm going to write in a language that marries up to that language so I have to do less work. And, you know, if something breaks, I can blame someone else, you know, that sort of thing. Um, do you require a database? Some languages are good for integrating with databases. Some languages are not good for integrating with databases. Um, I would not do database integration with Bash. Um, in fact, most of the time if I'm going to do database integrations, uh, was anyone here in Dan's session, in Jam, uh, Dan's Jam session? Yeah, um, so he did PHP MySQL, which is a, a very standard pairing, um, the, the LAMP stack, so Linux, Apache, uh, MySQL, PHP, um, that's a good thing is, you know, that's the sort of stuff. And the other thing, can you learn what you want to write this in in time? Because often we have deadlines and we need to 
like work within the boundaries of what we know, but you know, maybe it's, it's time for a little bit of personal growth and you can piece together the bits that you want. Um, when you're using, like I refer to PHP as the, um, the basically the bash of, of OO languages. It's, it's actually really quite simple and it's easy and it's dirty and it's, you can do very much some unstructured code and I do a lot of it because I'm usually integrating with things that are PHP based in the first place. Um, but it, because it does pre-processing and does the HTML render and it's the templating engine and all of those bits and pieces, you can find that you have a HTML page and you can just embed little snippets of PHP code in it to go and get data for you. That's kind of useful. Um, so that's good. <sighs> Plan. Very important. So outline your goals. What are you trying to achieve? You know, what do you want to make out of, you know, out of this? You know, where are you going with it? What do you want to achieve? Be concise with that. That should give you a set of features. What do you want it to do? Define a very clear feature set. I can't stress this enough because I have been guilty of making this mistake almost every time I start a new project. I go there. And that's not a good place because if you do feature creep, uh, sorry, if you get too much into feature creep, quite often what you're intending to do and what you're outlining and what your target is and what your goal and what you're trying to achieve ultimately, um, my time has stopped. <laughs> um, what you're trying to achieve ultimately will get polluted or will get so convoluted and complex that you won't be able to achieve what you set out to achieve cleanly in the first place and things go south. So. Be very, very clear about what you want to achieve, how you're going to define your feature set, and avoid your creep. Design. So over the last six months on the, I guess the last undertaking I did, I um, sort of suddenly became, yeah, sorry, uh, a quasi UI designer, for want of a better term. And this was an interesting experience for me. Um, I suddenly realized exactly how much, how important it is and how much effort has to go into it and how much thought has to go into it and how much testing has to go into it. And then exactly how many times you revise something, which I think was in the order of about 200 on what I was working on. Um, and so your UI design, so it's not just the placement of the elements on the screens, things like that. It's the workflow, how you're going to step through it, what you're going to do to pull it all together what it's going to look like ultimately. Um, so keep it logical. What are you trying to achieve? What are the steps that you need to take to do that? What's the user input going to be to achieve it? Um, you know, keep it simple. Remember your feature set. Avoid your creep. Go through it all like that. Keep your user interface together as you're putting this up. Um, so that's something that a lot of people don't realize. Text is actually a UI. So when you're doing a bash script that asks for input or something like that, keep your UI consistent, ask the same questions in the same sequence regardless of what's going on. If you create something that has a text menu, make sure that the menu items remain static. They don't expand or contract according to that sort of thing. You need to think these things through because you will find that people who start using it, so even internally in your organization or you, you'll start blindly typing keystrokes because you know that's the one that it is. So if you keep those static and consistent, like for me, one of those things is like I might have options one, two, three, and four for my top menu, but I'll have 99 as exit. And 99 will always be exit, no matter where you are. Um, just simple little things like that. Um, make sure it's easy to understand, so it's concise, it's giving you instructions, you know what's going on. Be consistent. These are all points that I've raised. This is the last one. Um, so guilty of not doing this, um, but avoid trying to do cool things. Like some things are trendy, some things look cool. Like, I mean, I played around a lot with uh, collapsi collapsible accordions in a web interface because they look cool. They were really good. You could actually minimize the amount of information on screen and you could hit a little disclosure arrow and things would expand out and you'd see what's underneath and it was all on one page and it was really good, but bugging me if it didn't get hard to find stuff. Um, because when the thing was hidden, I couldn't search the text on the page. I couldn't do any of those things. And it was really um, annoying me. So I discarded all of those. Um, 
display only relevant information. Don't do the, what I call the Microsoft packaging thing. You know, what is it? What are you displaying? What are you talking about? Keeping it simple. Um, and reduce or eliminate as many steps as you can in what you're doing. So the very simple thing is to tie this together is let's have a look at something. So uh, this is a Jamf open source project that is a front end on Reposado. This page is complex. Um, it's quite convoluted. All of your settings are in one place. Everything's there. You've got to scroll. If it looks like that, we'll notice that the scroll bars disappeared. And so I'm going to go back. And you can see that there are sort of things there. And we have to jump into something to look at something else because I believe I really needed to see two screens here because if you see how we've got some little links for the names up there, if you flick into those links, you then see these two buttons here. And I figured, yeah, they can just be on the outside of it. You just move them one notch out so that they're in a place that's actually easy to use. Um, and just keeping everything simple. So I, I grouped things together. I made it obvious where you needed to go for it. I don't believe a scroll bar appears on this page as you play around with it. So it, it kind of looks good. And it's easier to use from that perspective. And there seems to be, if we go there, less. And it's a real case of less is more. Am I making sense here? Can everyone actually see the little bits? And they're just so subtle. But it's, um, it's a real finesse art. Um, this. I had red buttons, green buttons, blue buttons, gray buttons, depending on context. context. Um, so like I had green buttons for, for new things and red buttons for delete things and a blue button for the default action on something and a, a gray button. But you know what? It just looked like a Christmas tree. Um, I think that was Bart's words from last year. Last year yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, but it did. And so you know, when I've been working on things, I've been trying to actually limit my color palette. Um, because it is just easier to look at ultimately um, and easier to work with. You can see that sort of goes hand in hand with the next thing, which is um, because if you overuse color or you are using color for a specific purpose, you want to keep things apart because it gets really ugly. But when I say physical separation of items, what's wrong with that? Now, it might not seem like much to you, but it's a confirmation dialog box. The dismiss button and the proceed button are right next to each other, and there are no boundaries on them. So the chance of a misclick is now very, very, very high. That is much better. So is the background, by the way. Um, but clear delineation. We've actually, we've used a minimal amount of color that marries up to everything else is around it. And it's very hard to misclick at this sort of thing. So anyway, you would have noticed a lot of the screenshots there. If you are running up a web application, and actually, if you're running up a desktop application and you use something like AngularJS in the background, we're not going to dive into that because that's where things start to get really, really heady. Um, you can use this on the front end. Does anyone know what Bootstrap is? Very few people. OK. Um, so I think it was the good people at Twitter um, created a bunch of user interface elements uh, that render in web browsers. Um, and it's very easy to create a web page that front ends something like that is a front end to a script that is running in the back end. Um, so that the things that we just saw, most of that is driven by bash under the bonnet and PHP is just doing function calls to bash. It's very simple to do. Like as a sysadmin, it's not that difficult to put a web UI on a script, particularly something that's server side. Um, and WebKit Framework and a couple of other little bits and bobs that are in the OS allow you to do things like that as well. So it's not very difficult to take a Bash script and turn it into a GUI app that runs natively on your Mac or out of a browser. It's a really simple, easy process. Um, so anyway, um, I digress. The, the background information here is that the good people at Twitter made a mob mobile first responsive UI element set. Um, and I don't know whether you've noticed that most websites look like this now because every bugger uses it. Um, it's just like it's spacing out the elements, it's making the buttons pretty, it allows you to customize it, and it's all basically done in CSS and JavaScript. And it's, 
It's really simple to implement. It's got a great set of instructions. You just go straight to the website, download the kit. You can even actually just structure a directory on your computer and open up an HTML page locally and have Bootstrap do all your renders for you. Um, and it is really, really easy to make a very, very nice UI using that stuff without doing like very much custom code at all. Um, if you want to do it default. All right, so we've got through all of the abstracts and all of the bits and pieces that you have to think about and the planning and things like that. So finally build it. So you can start making it. That's great. Iterate. Um, I mentioned before, revisions. Lots and lots and lots of revisions. Use it, use it to death. And when you make your changes, do small logical change blocks. So don't do great big huge chunks of code in one hit. Um, I've been guilty of doing that in the past and then I want to roll back but only part way. But small logical changes, very good. Document said changes. Because if they're small and logical, you can simply have a title for the change and a very brief description of 10 to 20 words, if that. Like it might be three words, but if you know what you did and you can see the changes in the code and all that sort of stuff. So um, let's get to Git workflows. <laughs> So, um, because I, I use Git and I do all my teeny tiny little changes and things like that and I keep track of things and I know what's going on and I can roll back to specific points in time and you can pluck things out. But um, I just want to talk about a couple of things because you can create something in Git and you can create a, like a master branch and you can start working with it. Um, that's great. But you might want to deviate from that branch or you might want people in your organization, like other people in your team or other people, if you're putting this out publicly, to only use that branch and you might want an experimental branch or a development branch or something like that. Something that you can mess around in that no one has to play with um, or no one should be playing with or you can point them back to what you call the master branch. So creating a development um, branch of things in your code base if you're responsible for your Git repository is really good. Um, so here we have, I think, a master branch which is really good and it hasn't been updated for, I don't know, and somebody else did the update. But then we have a look at the exact same project and there's a development branch which has a whole bunch of other stuff in it which is what's gonna come next, um, as far as I'm concerned. But I work in a different place and keep things out of the way. Um, the other thing that you can do in Git is forking stuff. So you might find a repository out there online that you want to make some changes to, or you want to work with, or you want to customize for your organization. So you can fork it, so it makes a copy of the entire code base, and then you can start working with that fork, or that is your version of that software. Um, so I use this, uh, like, I mean, I fork code in an unusual scenario sometimes, because what I do is fork the code from the main repository online, then I'll make a lot of changes because quite often if you want to submit something important back in or a big change, you don't want to be, or you need to commit, or there's an approval process on the public Git repository for any form of change commit even into a development branch or even a branch creation process or any of those things. You just don't want to get, in with that red, get stuck with that red tape. So you can do a fork of it and you can work on it. Um, and then you can do a thing called a pull request and send it back into the other thing. So this is, I believe, what we were looking at before. Um, so that is somebody else's version of it. And that is my version of it, which has got lots and lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of changes. And eventually I'll come back and push this back into the main branch and ask for a commit. So that's that. Test. Test your stuff. Test it in a way that you've never tested anything before because you are now probably too close to it. You have done this so many times. You have iterated it. You have walked through your own workflow. You know exactly how to use this. You wrote the code. You know exactly how it works in the back end. You know everything about it. You are now too close to it <laughs> um, because you can't be objective. Um, so you have to put yourself in the shoes of the end user. You have to forget everything you know about it. You have to start using it blind. Um, and that's really hard to do. So get pilot test users. Make other people your guinea pig, force people into it, do things like that, walk through it, work with them, and then iterate. Um, finally, this is a really big thing. How many people have put scripts out there that they don't document? Everyone. Can I actually, let me do this. It's, I have never, ever, ever put a script out. <laughs> All right, code comments, they're good. 
So if it's a script and you don't want to write a user guide and all of that sort of stuff, or it's fairly simple, or it's doing a, a non-interactive task or anything like that, code comments. Code comments are really good. What's this bit of the code doing? What's it supposed to be doing? You know, um, you made it seem like code comments are good. User guides. They're fun to write. Um, I, I tend to make that somebody else's problem. Um, I walk them through the product and make them show me a guide of, of their interpretation of it. Um, and then I tune it up as intended and work through them and things like that. So user guides are very good. Support documentation, what can go wrong with it? Because these are systems and systems are fantastic and perfect when the person who wrote it and the person who's been developing it and iterating it and going through it all and documenting it and all that like, knows everything about it. Um, but you know everything's perfect until you add a user to it. And it all goes to shit at that point in time. <laughs> because users will find ways to break things that you didn't even know were ways. <laughs> I, have, I, I, just, I have no words for that. Um, so uh, I think Eric mentioned it this morning about the, the original script that became AutoDMG. I, I wrote that to prove a point that you needed to do system specific builds of like, uh, sorry, you had to do hardware specific builds of the Mac OS for deployment. That was very important. And I wanted to prove a point that you could do it quickly and you could do it cleanly. Um, and and Pear asked me for the, the script at the tail end of it and I said, yeah, have at it. I don't want to do this anymore anyway. Uh, and and that was born out of it. But the um, I guess the point I'm trying to make there is that I had that posted now on GitHub, which I took down. I've, I'd forgotten about it, but I kept getting emails about this thing and I'd actually had a couple of positional parameters that you set when you set it up that you told it where you were going to save the image. Users were selecting the disk they were imaging. <laughs> they were trying to save the image back to the thing they were imaging. And, you know, Bash ain't that smart. Sorry? It saves space. <laughs> Bash ain't that smart. It did not get happy about that. But, like, things that you didn't even know were things became things. <laughs> It's like, okay, yeah, that's fine. So document it, what can go wrong? Um, so anyway, all of that aside, um, I'm now running a little bit early. I will, uh, and bearing in mind, so I've got to preface, uh, preface this a little bit. Um, so I know this is a non-JAMP session, but what we actually wrote was specifically to tie into JAMP um, to do with uh, the release of, um, of Jamf Pro 10.2 when they opened up the ability to add external patch definitions. Um, so very quickly, just what it is, and I'll tie what I was talking about to the key points back from the screen grabs that we're going to see in a moment. Um, so Kenobi, uh, not a Star Wars geek. Well, actually, probably a Star Wars geek. Um, but this is actually loosely translated from Japanese. Uh, thank you, Gene, for that one. Can you put your hand up? <laughs> um, so he named it. and. It's basically functional beauty, beauty of function, simplicity and elegance of design. I liked that. That stayed with me. Um, so this is the, the product logo and things like that. And I know that the Mac admins are a bunch of tightwads, so we open sourced it. Um, <laughs> um, so it's free and we're giving it away, so that's fun. And you can check it out at kenobi.io. Uh, that'll take you here, and you can, sorry, very brief picture of the web page. Um, it's also sitting up in the Jamf marketplace now, which is cool. And I think that's the marketplace page, yes, yes we are. And this is tying all of those principles together. So let's have a look at this. I had iterations that had a, uh, what is that, I think an edit and a delete button, a blue one and the red one, the, the new button was green. Um, now that actually, I got rid of the edit button and moved it over to a hyperlink to jump through it. I had enable and disable buttons like toggles and I just thought, oh, actually I'll bind that to a checkbox and that'll make things easy and stuff like that. And there's a lot less information on that page. Um, I like modals. Um, I don't know whether they're a cool thing or not, but I can't get enough of them because it's a really easy way to actually not refresh a page and drop down information and populate it with stuff on the fly. These are really, really easy to implement in Bootstrap and it makes it nice and simple and you can put a little bit of JavaScript in the back end that has just a bunch of regular expressions on every field that validates the input. So it basically makes it, makes it impossible for a user to put invalid data in there. 
And we like that because that means that you don't get the stupid calls. Um, <laughs> well, you try, you get fewer of them anyway. Um, so, you know, that was creating software title and then adding it in there. So we actually, so the link up there, which is the name of the product, if you click on it, you drill into it and there you can actually see more stuff about the patch definition because this thing is basically an API endpoint that publishes a JSON for, for Jamf to talk to, but effectively, I just bolted a UI editor on JSON here. Um, so I just read the JSON into the background, used PHP to render it all, put a bootstrap UI on the front end of it, and it all looks nice and pretty. Now, um, I didn't want to be reading file by file because I thought this actually thing could get hit fairly hard if you had hundreds and hundreds of definitions, so I stored everything in a database. But the, it generates the JSON endpoint on the fly. So I've got PHP talking to a database, which, by the way, was going to be MySQL and became SQLite. Um, and that was really simply because of support. Because I didn't want to be dealing with troubleshooting people's MySQL installations um, because that is actually something that's very easy to screw up. I've screwed plenty of them up in my life. Um, so having SQLite in there and using um, one of the very nice things in PHP, which they call PDOs, which is PHP data objects, um, which is an abstraction layer for your database engine. So in Dan's session, if you watch the video, he talks about, um, about how PHP has multiple connectors. It also has this one magical connector. Um, called PDO, which has a standard SQL syntax that you can connect to 14 different database engines. So I can actually change the database engine in two lines of code on this and point it to something else. And all of the generation is exactly the same. So all of the SQL statements, everything like that is in the abstraction layer that sits within the language that's running things. I don't know whether they're more or less secure. I didn't think that this was mission critical data, so I didn't investigate it. Um, but having a, a SQLite database, which is a zero config, so if it hits the page and it doesn't see a database, it just simply creates it with the schema. Done. No setting up a server, no binding anything, no user accounts, no passwords, nothing, just done. Um, like I said, not mission critical information, and you would have to get access to the box to, the box to mess with this. Um, so a uh, very simple editor for requirements, uh, a nice subtle little thing that you can just add them, stack them, having value lists for things that I know are values that are the only values you can use within Jamf itself because it has to marry up to those things. So no more, no less, and no custom values because custom values are gonna bite you on the ass at this point in time. Um, and then a list of all of the patches that go with it and what their release times were and all of that sort of thing and tables that are sortable and like all of this stuff is like bootstrap and plugins and other bits and pieces and just like it's a bunch of stuff that I've cobbled together. I really can't take credit for writing very much of this. I can take a lot of credit for thinking about how I put it together, but a lot of the code that is actually running this thing is not mine. Um, it's other people's and it's been put together nicely. And yeah, drilling into it more details so we can see once again, there's things like another, another nice UI element, a date picker that actually date stamps and formats and won't let you screw it up and does those things so you can pick everything right down to the second. I don't know why you would actually want to know any more than the day for a release day, but the date format that, have, that has to be recorded is all the way down to that. Um, what else have we got in there? Various components that make up our software. But as you can see, it's basically, it's a, like it's just a simple left to right workflow. So you create something and you just, just work across the page and then everything's done. That's it. Uh, and of course there is a database there. So I put a backup and restore function on it because you might want that one day. You might want to migrate it to new hardware. And scheduling, all of those bits and pieces. Now, this is big news. Like when I was talking about support models, we worked with Jamf support when we were putting this together to make sure that they are aware of it, they know how it works, they know everything about it, their internal support team is briefed. I mean, obviously the primary support model for this is the online resources and us and things like that. But if you are having a problem with the way Jamf Pro is talking to this, you can engage with Jamf. So it's a Jamf supported integration. So that's it with three minutes up my sleeve. <laughs> Thank you.